All right, everyone. Welcome to the first official episode of Medical Mythbusters. Um, we've been wanting to do this series for a while, and uh, we're kicking off the first episode with a very special guest that, frankly, doesn't need an introduction. But uh, I have Dr. Fisher here. So, Andy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, uh, good to be here, Austin. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about what uh, you know our subject today. But uh, yeah, I am a uh, general surgery. Uh, resident right now, but I used to be a PA in the 75th Range Regiment, uh, and I used to be a paramedic before that. I am on the uh, Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, uh, Chairman of National Stop the Bleed Month, uh, on a couple other different committees that have to do with like things like hemorrhage control and pre-hospital trauma care. Uh, so a lot of a uh, lot of different things I do, uh, but it is all focused on you know. You know, hemorrhage control for the most part and how to save more lives in the pre hospital setting. Okay, so it's fair to say you know a thing or two about tourniquets. Um, it's fair to say that, um, but I still feel uh, like I'm learning every day. All right, yeah, that's fair. All right, so our first episode uh, is going to go on one I think that uh, has been preached for a while. It's definitely still preached today. It was one that definitely I learned through my CLS courses. Um, and I think it's one of many topics that's still just kind of regurgitated, but it's never, you know, the question as to why has not really been asked. So I want to go ahead and address that. And that's this, uh, this theory um, that you should carry one tourniquet per limb. So a total of four tourniquets that that should be the standard for everybody. And this extends to even on the civilian side, you see, you know, range ninjas and everybody else on Instagram walking around with a tourniquet every four feet, you know, on their on their kit. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think it's one practical? Do you think this is um, do you think this is something that's necessary or do you think this is more of a, more of something that was preached for a while and was never never really considered the actual science behind it? I think it's probably like uh, like tampons right you know someone someone did something once and then it was kind of passed down uh and it, it, all of a sudden it became like a good idea yeah there there probably wasn't any actual evidence that kind of supported their use so yeah it's, it's probably just yeah someone thought it was a good idea and they kind of passed it down the line so what do you think do you do you happen to know any statistical data or anything do you know of any instances where four tourniquets have been applied or, and i guess this uh sub uh, question there is four tourniquets have been applied and necessary to have been applied for a patient outcome um do you happen to know anything uh, uh, about any case studies such as that yeah, I mean, I mean, there certainly four tourniquets have been used uh, previously, you know, in these combat casualties. I think it's rare. I mean, I think if you look at the oh, some of the studies that have come out of Iraq, it's a small percentage of of people who who require four tourniquets. Um, the problem with some of those studies is, you know, you kind of look at it and go, okay, they had four tourniquets applied, but they did they need those all four tourniquets applied. And, and I think it's probably not necessarily, hey, I'm going to apply one on each limb. It's, it's probably because they have, you know, um, poor hemorrhage control and say like lower extremities. So if they have, you know, uh, step on IED, they have bilateral lower extremity amputations, and now they have to somehow control hemorrhage. Either, you know, they maybe they don't can put on the tourniquet well the first time, and so it doesn't control hem the bleeding, so they got to put it on another one. Uh, so I've seen it a couple of different times where we've had to use uh, four, a total of four tourniquets, which was two on each lower extremity, uh, both, well, I'm sorry, not both, but you know, they were actually different mechanisms. Uh, one uh, was an IED uh, and one was uh, due to uh, mortar, enemy, enemy mortar landing inside of a compound that we were defending and uh, shrapnel hit hit uh, one of the mortar guys so and we had to yeah like i said we have to do it. it it does happen i don't think it's very common and i don't know if if each person carrying four tourniquets is going to matter because we certainly didn't use his tourniquets okay yeah and so i think that's where it's where it's preached upon that everybody should have four tourniquets on them so that the responding medic because obviously 
in the instance where you need four tourniquets, self-application goes out the window. And I think we've spoken before about the reality of self-application. Um, but I think that idea kind of goes out the window as well as, um, cause there, there's a couple of variables to look at here. One is the, you know, the victim's IFAC going to stay intact from, you know, a blast injury that causes the need mm -hmm. for, cause, because I think the, um, the common idea here of four tourniquets, it's one per limb. So, you know, quadruple amp amputee is what typically is, is the poster child here, right? They say one for yeah. each limb or, you know, one shot per each limb. Uh, so I guess, uh, I guess the question here is uh, what, what, what do you think, like maybe in terms of combat care, uh, carrying four as like uh, command SOP, uh, versus like your everyday, you know, Instagrammer that goes to the range and they do their high speed, low drag kits and they're mimicking the same thing as Middle East. Do you think it's still practical? Do you think it's necessary? What, I, what do you think there? I do not believe it's necessary to put four tourniquets if you're going to the range. Uh, I, I And also, as as you kind of touched upon is if you believe that you have one tourniquet for each limb, what is the likelihood that if you are injured that you are going to be able to apply a tourniquet to each limb or someone's going to be able to respond in a quick enough fashion to be able to apply for tourniquets to each limb you know it it has happened right we've seen that there are these quadruple amputees it does happen i'm suggesting that it is rare that that sort of incident would happen uh, especially uh, here in the United States, uh, if you're at the range or, or you know, even in, in, say, an active shooter situation. I just don't think it's very common in, uh, or a worthwhile effort to kind of prepare for something like that. Okay, yeah, I could definitely see it. All right, so I guess that'll, that'll bring us to the counterpoint, right? So um, we talked about likelihood, um, instances where it's happened because it's so far it seems like this it, it's a plausible concept right it's something that could happen um so i guess the counterpoint here let's go ahead and address the counterpoint is would it hurt say the instagrammer or anybody else from caring for tourniquets and if not you know what would you say about like you know, if somebody came on to one of the Facebook pages and they're like, hey, I'm putting together my kit, you know, I want to build some medical. And, you, you know, you often see the people saying, oh, make sure you have one tourniquet per limb. What what would you address? How would you address that counterpoint? And I don't I don't know, man. I mean, it, it's just it just seems a little ridiculous. I mean, it costs money to to put these tourniquets on your kit. Uh, it, it's a logistical, I guess, it's kind of a little bit of a logistical burden to be able to do that. Uh, and I don't think tourniquets are necessarily benign. Yeah. I believe that they, we've kind of swung in the opposite direction with, with this idea of tourniquets, right? It's like, Hey, everyone gets a tourniquet. Well, they're not benign and, and there are adverse events that are associated with it. Uh, sure. For the most part, up to two hours, you're pretty safe, but you know, if people believe they're going to be in this situation to where, oh man, I'm going to have to apply four tourniquets, is the same, are you going to be able to then evacuate in an appropriate timely manner? Uh, and what do, you, what do you do if you can't? And, and furthermore, the time it takes, so if it, say if you're in an active, quote unquote, active shooter situation, or you're in this care under fire situation, the time it would take to apply all these tourniquets because you just think they need to be applied because you know who cares they're tourniquets and they're safe you you are exposing yourself to an unnecessary amount of danger uh instead of t you know taking the quick you know time to evaluate for any massive hemorrhage and determine if a tourniquet needs to be applied you know you just apply tourniquets Anyone who's ever been in, in a you know gunfight that's been under fire and trying to take care of casualties, the last thing you want to do is be sitting out there going, "Well, let me put this tourniquet on." Uh, no, you you are trying your hardest to get a quick evaluation done and get out of there. So take the time, take the extra you know ten to fifteen seconds if that if, if that to determine if an actual tourniquet needs to be used. Uh, so yeah, you're looking at uh, those sort of situations where is it? Am I in the situation where it's dangerous? And here I am trying to apply all these different tourniquets when they're maybe not needed, 
Uh, or is it a case where, hey, I'm, I'm applying these tourniquets, but am I going to be able to get out of where I need to be within the, what we quote unquote, safe two hour mark? Uh, or is it even something like, hey, if I apply tourniquet, is it, is it going to cause an adverse event? I, I, I think that the, the likelihood of truly a bad adversity outcome is slim. But man, I just I, I think we need to be smart about how we approach, you know, sort of you know, approach hemorrhage control in the pre-hospital setting, whether you're uh, military, uh, civilian EMS, public safety, or you're just a bystander. Uh, you know when to apply tourniquet and don't just blindly go out there and apply tourniquet because you can. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All righty. Well, um, so I think um, I think to, to leave this message, it's plausible, but, you know, not really necessary. Right. For especially like civilian EMS. Is that kind of fair to, to kind I, of I, say? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's fair to say that it's plausible that four tourniquets may need uh, to be used, um, you know, on yourself or on someone around you. Uh, but but I, I I prefer to be prepared, say by, by by having a smaller first aid kit in my car or in a range bag, and not necessarily like I got you know four to six tourniquets you know on my kit. Right. Would it, would it be fair to say that that burden kind of lies more on the responding medic to have the appropriate medical supplies, or is it fair because another. Another concept I hear preached a lot is, you know, you, you have to carry all this stuff on you so, you know, the medic can use on you, which I def there's definitely some some uh, reality there. There's definitely some, you know, uh, validity there. Um, but would you say that that burden kind of falls more on being a prepared medic or first responder than expecting? Because especially you see it in civilian side, right? Like civ civilians at the range are carrying all this kit just in case somebody responds to them. Well, civilian side's not military side, so anybody who hops out of the back of an ambulance or like a, a range medic, I feel like that burden kind of falls on them to be prepared rather than, you know, them to expect you. Because I think I think some people fall under this misconception that in the U.S., a responding medic is going to search you, search your IFAC to use your own equipment, um, which falls, you know, under, you know, legal issues. They could risk their their search for that because you know what's to say you don't have an amazon tourniquet on you that breaks when they apply it yeah so, so would you say that's kind of a fair point i i think it's uh, a little uh to, a couple points well yes ems should always be prepared uh, or you know whatever whatever public safety you have responding should have the necessary equipment on them uh two if you're if you are working say you are working with a team uh you know, be be responsible. Uh, make sure your team is responsible and everyone is prepared. I think the idea of of you know going to a situation where not you know I'm the only person that's having to be carrying you know someone for hemorrhage control is uh is kind of the wrong mindset nowadays. So everyone should have the ability to carry their own stuff or carry some, you know, a small amount of uh, hemorrhage control de uh, devices and be able to utilize, uh, use, use that or share it with whoever is, whoever is going to be responding. Um, not necessarily responding, but, you know, uh, within that group. Uh, certainly, I mean, we see this in combat, right? We see that er if everyone has an IFAC and has the ability to respond, then we help decrease the amount of deaths from simple things like hemorrhage control. I know that, you know, my, my old boss disagrees with me on this. Uh, and, and that's fine. I mean, he's, he's very experienced and I respect his, his, uh, perspective saying that he doesn't expect responders to be able to provide hemorrhage control for things, say things like, uh, you know, other bystanders. So if you, if you're working a military team or working in like a police or first responder team that, you shouldn't necessarily be expected to provide your hemorrhage control devices for someone else. But my point is, is that the likelihood of everyone needing to utilize those, that, that amount of equipment is pretty small and you could probably get by with making sure that everyone just has like, as we discussed, basic hemorrhage control devices, you know, two tourniquets and, and being able to share that if needed. That makes it. I mean, it, I feel like maybe I talk a little too much about that, but but I think it's kind of a, the whole point about being it being prepared is everyone is on board with the same sort of you know concept of teamwork and effort in order to 
you know, help uh, prevent any sort of death and, and uh, not having one person to be, you know, out there being uh, tactical Timmy and, and having six tourniquets on them. Right, right. Which, which you do see a lot of on the Instagram, and it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, no, I definitely appreciate your insight, and thank you for uh, coming on and, uh, and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, do you have any, I think, I think we hit on the, the subject enough, do you have any like parting thoughts or words for listeners on this? Like maybe some, uh, maybe some advice, because inevitably this topic's going to be brought up uh, when somebody asks how many tourniquets they should have on them. Uh, is there anywhere you would point them to get uh, kind of information for that? Yeah, you know, I don't necessarily have great, uh, there isn't a lot of great studies out there. I would say, what, let me point out that I think you should probably stick with one type of tourniquet. So people carry, you know, I carry a soft tee, I carry a cat, and then, then I may have another type of tourniquet. I think that's the wrong answer. I think everyone on this on the team should utilize the same uh, same type of tourniquet, one tourniquet for everyone, and, and choose what you want. You know, there there are a lot of great tourniquets out there. I don't have any uh, I I don't have any financial disclosures to make about uh, you know any of these tourniquet manufacturers. I think they all are great, um, but all of them do have some setbacks. But find one that you like that you prefer and you like to use, uh, and then, you know, make sure everyone around you, if you're working on a team and you are, you are the one making that, that, that decision, everyone knows how to use, use it. All righty. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Um, and then we'll have a new topic next month for everybody. So stay tuned for that. All righty. Thanks, All right. Andy. Yeah. Thank you.